We need to do a sound check, right? Yeah, just a quick sound check. <laughs> Let's try just just up there. Maybe um. No. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh huh. Is that how you want us to see yeah. it? Does that look? It's good. Do you want it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Maybe if people could just give a thumbs up if they can hear you. All right. So good morning, everybody. I am muted. It says I'm muted. Um, you're the speakers in that, that camera. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So can you hear me, everybody? Thumbs up. Yes. Great. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I was told we have to make do a sound check. And let me know if there's a problem. Uh, raise your hand in whatever way that you can do that. And then um, we may be able to fix that. So, welcome to the first full day of Seshin at Hokioji. And I want to extend my gratitude to all the people who have made this happen. <laughs> it's quite amazing, it's quite a miracle. Um, and all the people, the residents who live here at Hokioji have really worked very hard to get this all organized. And I know how hard it is to 
uh, organize a regular session. Uh, but this one is so much more difficult to, you know, see how, how we can distance ourselves and be safe at the same time as we uh, practice together. And I'm very grateful that we are able to do this again together, Dokai and Daigaku. Um, I really enjoyed it and I'm, I'm grateful that we have been invited again this year. So these talks um, during Sashin are supposed to be an encouragement for Zazen. And Dogen gave us this Fukan Zazengi as instructions, universal instructions for the practice of Zazen. I remember my first Zazen instruction. In the beginning, I was not really interested in another religion. I had given up uh, religion in my teens and I wasn't interested to get into anything new. So a friend took me to Green Gulch Farm, since it was just a beautiful place. And I liked, I liked the people. I thought, oh, there is something different here. They are so kind and not cynical, not critical. They just, they just genuine and enjoy themselves. They have a good time. I wanted to be like that. So I went to Zazen instruction because that seemed to be the thing that everybody was talking about, uh, Zazen, and I didn't know what that was. And so, as you know, anybody who has ever been a new student of Zen had the same instructions that Dogen gives us here. Um, sit in the full or half lotus position, or at least in a stable posture. Make sure your robes, your clothing is loose so you can sit relaxed, but in an orderly fashion. Have your hands in the cosmic mudra. Make sure your spine is straight with your head balanced on your shoulders, right on top of the spine, so that your breath can freely flow. Have the tongue against the front roof of your mouth, behind your front teeth, and your mouth should be shut, your teeth closed, and have a soft breath. Just breathe gently through your nose. And when you start meditation, deep breath to start with and exhale. And find yourself into a steady, immovable sitting position. So that sounds pretty simple. So what do I do now? <laughs> and Dogen or any of the teachers who give instructions say, well, don't think, think of not thinking. <laughs> well, how do I do that? Well, just let things go. Uh, Dogen calls it non-thinking, which doesn't mean you shouldn't think or you should think, but just don't think about it. Just let it happen. Whatever happens there, just sit. Whatever comes up, welcome it, accept it, and let it go. Don't have any attachments. And this is the essential art of Zazen. 
That's what Dogen says. This is the essential art of Sazen. And you wonder, is there not anything else? <laughs> Isn't there something dramatic that should be happening here? <laughs> well, um, Blanche Hartmann was really happy when she finally felt that she could do this. She could actually sit and not think about anything. And she was very happy and she told her teacher, Shunryu Suzuki, who uh, was the founder of San Francisco Zen Center, and her teacher, um, she said, I can, I, can, I can finally sit, I can finally do Zazen. And he said, no, you don't do Zazen. Zazen does Zazen. So she said the same, he said the same thing that we heard last night from Daigaku. This is, it's not you who is doing anything here. Actually, you're supposed to let go of your own attachments, your own concepts, your ideas. You shouldn't try to do anything. That's not how it's done. And Dogen goes further in his instructions. Actually, I'd like to talk a little bit about these instructions. They, they were not new, obviously. They, people, monks had been sitting in this posture for thousands of years, long before Buddhism came about. It's a yogic posture. And, um, and so this was kind of written down finally by Baijang, as far as we know, Baijang Huaihai, a great Zen master who lived around 800, who had a large monastery. He organized a monastery with a monks, um, a sustainable, sustainable life for them. So they worked uh, in, the, in the fields so that they could actually uh, feed themselves. And he was very much like the other monks. He worked, you probably remember that, phrase, um, a day without work is a day without eating. That was, that was Bai Zhang. He, he said that and he lived that way. So he wrote these, um, it's a prospectus for the conduct of Zen monastic practice. And so these instructions, these other instructions were part of that. And Dogen must have gotten it from somebody. Maybe his two teacher, Ru Jing, gave him these instructions. But they were not really um, so different from any other meditation. But Dogen makes this difference. He says, I'm not talking about meditation practice. I'm talking about Zazen as a Dharma gate of joyful ease. Dharma gate of joyful ease. Well, that was not my experience. Certainly also many of the students that I've talked to did not think it was joyful ease to be sitting still for half an hour or 40 minutes. It was very hard. And it was hard physically, but also mentally. All the stuff that came up, all the doubts and the um, yeah, attachments that, that we have, uh, they suddenly show up in a way that is very uncomfortable. So how can you call this the Dharma gate of joyful ease? And Suzuki Roshi was asked, by a student, does it ever get easier? And he said, no, <laughs> no, you're stuck with this now. And I think what he meant was if he said, oh yeah, just wait, it'll get better soon. Then everybody would be expecting something, right? They would say, oh yeah, well, isn't it about time? I've been sitting here now for several years and it's still hurting. <laughs> um, well, actually, it's not getting better. You just have to accept it. And that's, and that's exactly the crucial point. We need to accept what is. 
So when Dogen calls it suchness, he says, practice suchness without delay. Suchness, which is what's happening right now. Just let it go, let it happen, let it happen without wanting it to be different, without having your own ideas about things. Just accept what's happening. Just be present with what is. Welcome whatever comes in whichever form. It's okay. So once you can do that, it does actually get easier, I have to say. I mean, you know, stuff still comes up. Obviously, we have this karmic body that doesn't just um, go away, right? <laughs> Things keep coming up, and uh, Dogen knew that very well, and he talked about that later on quite a lot, that we have to do continuous practice. We have to um, keep going with this. And certainly, um, when we, he, he mentions uh, the Buddha who was sitting silently, just sitting for however, however long, we don't really know, but you know, some say seven days, some say seven years. And what is the Buddha story? He left home. He was, he had an incredible opportunity to be one of the most influential and powerful people, to be an heir to his father, who was, you know, they say a king or a raja, and he was a ruler of the warrior caste. So the Buddha had a good career in front of him. And he said, no, this life is not, is not satisfying. I have to find the end of suffering. So he, he started um, out with meditation because that's what people were doing. He saw some monks who seemed very peaceful. And he was very good at it. He, he studied with uh, some of the great yogis in, uh, in India. And still, and he was good. He, he became really good. They wanted him to be their successor, but he said, no, actually, it's not really what I want because I always come back into this life again, even when I can get out of my body for a while. But this is not the end of the suffering that I'm talking about. And then he thought, maybe it's the body that's keeping me from experiencing bliss and ease. Because, you know, as a young man, especially all this testosterone happening there in the body, I'm sure he was feeling a lot of, you know, desires. And he said, that must be part of the body. Maybe I can get rid of this when I... Um, don't pay so much attention to the body. So he became an ascetic and he tried that for a while, for quite a long time, and he almost died because he stopped eating. And then he realized that's not, that's not the way because I will come back. If I die now, it's not, it's not going to be the end. I, I'll come back in the same way. And also I want to teach others to be able to, I want to relieve suffering for the whole world. I don't have a clock, so I'm not sure. <laughs> and uh, Dogen had the same uh, background. He also came from a noble family. He, he uh, even though uh, the, the situation in, in Japan at the time was, uh, there was a lot of upheaval uh, he was born in 1200, as you know, and the end of the 12th century had been um, very destructive. A lot of natural disasters happened. There is a, a little book by a monk who lived at that time, Kano no Chomei, and he talks about all these horrible things that happened. Uh, 
a fire that destroyed almost all of Kyoto, the palaces, everything was burned. And then there was a hurricane that completely destroyed the city again. And then there was an earthquake, terrible earthquake that went on and on for days with aftershocks. And then there was a famine and people really thought because so many were dying and it was so such a serious devastation that that they thought this is the end of the world we're coming close to the apocalypse and so when he was offered this job in the at the court which would have been a very you know, nice position. He said, no, I, I have to find out what life is about. This is not satisfying. I cannot, I cannot just sit um, in a nice chair and see what the, all the destruction happening. So he also had this wish and especially um, he also had a personal experience of impermanence when as you heard, his mother died when he was seven. His father had already died when he was two. His father was a, an influential, very high official at the court. And, and his mother was his mistress. He was brought up very, very well. He was very well educated. It says that he already was reading the Chinese scriptures uh, or, at the age of four. So he was very well educated and very precocious. So they thought he would be, he would be good, you know, he's an intellectual, he would be a wonderful person in the court, he, somebody who we need. But he said, no, I don't want to do this. So he went to become a monk in the Tendai tradition, which was the leading religion at the time. And he was, that wasn't what he wanted. He, he wasn't happy there. So then he tried out, um, Zen actually had already come to Japan. Uh, Ikai brought that from, from China, uh, where he had heard Linji, the Rinzai master, where this uh, was passed on and he brought that to Japan. So this this Rinzai Zen was already happening in Japan. It had just started, it was pretty new. And, and there were also other forms of Buddhism. There were Shinran, there were many. At that time, in the early 13th century, there was a lot happening in Japan. Obviously, this upheaval had to do with it, but that people were searching. So, he studied with Ekai, who died very soon, and then his uh, successor, Myozen, became his teacher. And still, he did not get his deepest quest answered. And, you know, we think, well, maybe they were not very clever, those people. Maybe he just didn't find the right person there. And I think that's probably not necessarily true. I think everybody has that experience that you hear the same things, you hear the same teachings, and suddenly it clicks. With one teacher, suddenly you have an affinity. You, ha you understand it. Oh, that's what it means. It's the same teaching. And there may, may have been many teachers who, uh, gave him very good answers, but he just didn't hear it. So he decided to go to China with his teacher Miu Zen, and Miu Zen then died in China, and finally, you know, uh, Dogen met Ru Jing. And that's when he understood. And it was through this acceptance, through this just letting go, that he found peace. It was in the middle of the night when the monks were sitting, zazen, they were doing a lot of zazen. And 
a monk who was sitting next to Dogen started dozing off. He started, he fell asleep and Ru Jing came and reprimanded him and said, you're not supposed to sleep here. You're supposed to drop off body and mind. And Dogen got it. He, it, he was able to let go at that moment. So this, this acceptance of what is, this is exactly, I think, what, what happened there for him. And he had this, you know, what they call breakthrough, this, this experience of joyful ease. So we often, so he said, uh, and I think he's talking about himself, that he was probably much too intellectual as a young man when he was looking for the answer. And he talks about, and I think he, when he's saying these words, find my glasses. Sorry, I'm trying to find my glasses. I thought, oh, here. I'm just quoting. Suppose you are confident in your understanding and rich in enlightenment, gaining the wisdom that knows at a glance, attaining the way and clarifying the mind, arousing an aspiration to reach for the heavens. So I think that that was his, his understanding. He was there. He was that person who had felt that he, he had understood. He had gotten it. And, and so why was he not satisfied? And I think it was because there was too much of this gaining mind of wanting to get something. Look, I'm waiting. Why can't I get this? And I think it really needs that, what the Buddha experienced, this just waiting, just sitting here, just sitting, not expecting anything just um, sitting sazen. And once you can do that, once this acceptance happens, this surrender to suchness, to what is, then this feeling of joyful ease can actually happen. So for this five-day session, I can tell you from my experience, um, and if, of course, if you've done many sessions, maybe that's not the same anymore, but I remember that the third day was the worst. So it, the, it started nice because, oh, this is, uh, finally I can sit, just be at peace. I come from a busy life, and now I'm, it's just silent, everything, nobody's bothering me. Oh, this is great. And the second day is usually okay. <laughs> and then on the third day, it's just awful. It's just, you're hurting and everything is, is bothering you and your neighbor is snorting or whatever. It's just like, I can't stand this. I can't stand this anymore. And what you do, you just sit because that's the form. And I think these forms really help us. Um, you just do what you're told. You just sit, you don't move, immovable sitting position. You just accept whatever is bothering you. If it's a mosquito or tiredness, anything, it doesn't matter. You just sit. So um, this is much harder when you're at home in your own home and maybe, you know, uh, it's not possible for you to find a completely silent spot. And maybe you have to look after your kids or you have to maybe keep your job or something. So I, I, I certainly feel with you, but if you can, if you can sit like this, this just sit with whatever is happening, I think it's very beneficial and you will really gain from this. And I hope that we can have a 
fall session here again in person with everybody and have this uh, wonderful experience all together again someday. Thank you very much.